All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to sort of get into the meat, I guess, and the content of this class. And one of the things that you'll notice is that in these videos, I'm going to spend a lot less time talking about, for example, names and dates. Some of them I'll get to, but for the most part, I'm not really interested in names and dates. A lot of those are in your textbook. What I am going to be spending a lot of time talking about is the ideas that underlie that and the sort of context for why this stuff matters. Uh, so for example, this video, we're not going to talk about facts at all. We're talking about two really, really important ideas that sort of come in behind our ideas of, behind the Canadian experience of colonization. Um, that's sort of this, first of all, this doctrinal idea, this idea about terra nullius, um, which is an idea about what is in the new, the, the quote, new world, okay? Um, and if you speak Latin, if you don't, don't worry about it. If you speak Latin, terra nullius means um, empty land. So terra for, for land and nullius for nothing. And that's an argument that sort of says that there was nothing um, in the New World before Europeans arrived. That means sort of that it was empty or it's a belief that functionally it was empty. We know, of course, that it's not empty, right? We're going to talk a lot about Indigenous history in this class, but there are consequences for Europeans coming to a new place and believing that it is functionally empty. Um, we can talk about what this looks like, for example, in the Australian school system, uh, which is also sort of shares some similar colonial history. The official doctrine is that terra nullius is what you teach students. You teach students that there was no one here first, so when the, when the uh, Brits arrived, they were the first people here. Um, and one of the things we have to understand is that that's sort of not what happened when we talk about colonization in Canada. Um, so at least early on, we sort of talk about, and we'll get into a whole lot of this sort of conversation about what our treaties actually are, um, but when we talk about really early Canadian history, there's a lot of conversation around how those are nation-to-nation -nation agreements. And you can't have an agreement with a nation if there's no nation here. If there's no people, there's no nations. Um, so that sort of idea about nation-to-nation -nation agreements is really, 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 really important. Um, and we sort of have to think about the idea about what early colonizers thought they were coming to. Um, and so terra nullius is one way of looking at that. Another way of looking at that is to think about what these early colonizers actually believed about the idea of civilization, right? What does, what has to be there in order for it to quote count as a civilization? Um, and in a lot of European contexts, that means a couple of things. So there's a piece about um, written history. There's a piece about permanent settlements, and there's sort of this idea that those two things, that idea about written history, so books essentially, um, and permanent settlements, so cities, are what builds a civilization. So that sort of explains some of the differences, I guess, between how Europeans related to the indigenous people in North America, which for the most part did only one or neither of those two things, and how they related to non-white populations, <clears throat> for example, in China, in India, where there is written history and there is that sort of permanent settlement piece. Um, and that's sort of this question about, are you dealing with civilizations? Is there anyone here worth talking about? And then also sort of an idea about what is the responsibility, like what counts as appropriate civilization. So there's this concept that we could talk about. Um, it's usually referred to as the white man's burden, which is this horrible phrase, but it's what it's called. And it's an idea that Europeans and sort of that Eurocentric model of civilization with written history, with that sort of piece, had a moral responsibility to bring that advancement. Okay, they genuinely thought that this was the best thing that had ever happened to anyone in the world, so they had this moral responsibility to bring it to everyone else. Um, and that sort of idea comes up a whole lot in Canadian history, right? That idea of a duty to civilize people uh, becomes really important when we start talking about things like residential schools, right? Um, because that's part of what they're trying to do. They're trying to sort of create that impression and create that sort of experience of civilization, right? 
And I don't really have a clear answer for you if, for example, the people coming to Canada early on in this civil in this colonization process really thought about Canada as an empty place or really thought that they had a responsibility to civilize the quote savages who already lived here. And that's not really important. What is really important for you to understand for this point, at least at least at this point, is the idea that those ideas are very much in the culture and in the ideas that is that are coming from these European sort of nations. Okay? So that's this one idea that's really about the relationship between Europeans and the sort of populations and the humans who already lived in North America. There's another set of ideas that's really important to understand in sort of the history of colonization, and that's about the relationship between European countries as, as it is expressed by having colonies. So the first sort of colonial settlements in North America are actually not in North America at all. They're in South America. And if you sort of remember all of your sort of vague history and whatnot from sort of Columbus, right? You get Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. And when Columbus sailed to the quote new world, as he called it, um, he landed in South America. And in South America, he wound up running into what is in a way I don't think many students understand a truly incalculable amount of wealth. So it's pretty common and pretty well understood that one of the things that co the Columbus sort of took back to the Spanish crown was a bunch of jewels and a bunch of precious metals, so gold and silver, um, that had been mined and sort of processed by the Aztec and the Inca. And that's really important to understanding the wealth process, sort of the idea of how wealth and colonization is connected to that. But the other thing that you need to understand about what Columbus found in, in his sort of new world travels when he got to South America, um, he got to a number of resources that nobody knew about beforehand. And so the Spanish crown essentially had an almost guaranteed monopoly on. And these are things that most of you have probably already consumed today. Um, but you haven't really thought about them as sort of at one point being these massive markers of wealth. So there are a number of crops that we consume on a regular basis in North America and in sort of the Western world that weren't, well, that, that were not known um, before Columbus arrived in South America. So here's a very quick list. Coffee, chocolate, tomatoes to a lesser extent. Tomatoes are native to South America. Um, and the other thing that Columbus found when he was in the sort of South America was an easy and reliable source of sugar, okay? And those four things create massive wealth um, in sort of European colonies, massive, uh, because they control everything. And on top of that, Columbus came back with gold and silver and gems. So a lot of European countries, France included, so the first sort of colonial power in Canada is France, and we'll get to that in, a set, in, in our next videos, but the first, a lot of other colonial powers when they sort of started looking for colonies in North America, in South America, in Africa, even in parts of Asia, was access to that kind of wealth. They were looking for that sort of peace. They were looking for the ability to generate the incredible wealth that Columbus had found in South America. That's one part of this sort of what motivates colonization, is that idea about we can find brand new wealth, and that's amazing. And the other thing that you sort of need to understand in terms of that relationship and that economic piece is something called mercantilism. Um, and mercantilism is an economic idea. It's a sort of economics arrangement of systems. And one of the things that you need to understand is that at the time when countries are first starting to colonize North America and certainly in Canada is that you're starting to see the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. You're starting to see the increasing production capacity that comes along with that, right? Like if you were making everything by hand before and now you have factories, you can make a whole lot more things. And one of the challenges that comes with that, and this is still a challenge we're dealing with in contemporary capitalism, is the idea that if you increase your capacity to produce a consumer good, tables, clothing, whatever it is, at a certain point, 
your ability to produce that good exceeds the number of people around you who want to buy it, right? If there are only a thousand households in the neighborhood, in, in the city where you work, and you've made a thousand tables, no one else needs tables, which sort of messes with your economic model and the value you get from producing factory, right? So one of the things that European powers needed to do in order to continue building that wealth in their industrial sort of centers was essentially to find new customers. And so there's an idea, and, and at the same time, right, if you've already produced a thousand tables, you've already used up the wood to produce a thousand tables. And so at the same time as you need to find new customers, you need to find new sources of raw resources in order to allow this sort of industrial production machine to continue happening. So one of the solutions the European sort of monarchs, business community, elite really, um, come up with is the idea that if you establish new colonies, if you sort of send people to North America, to South America, and you have them establishing whole new cities and whole new households, then they're going to need a lot of stuff. They're going to buy a lot of things. They're going to buy stoves, they're going to buy tables, they're going to buy clothing, they're going to buy all kinds of industrial machinery to do things like grind grain and that means that your industrialists can make a lot of money selling those products. Um, and so mercantilism is essentially an idea where people in colonies, so people in Canada, produce raw resources. So in the case of Canada we're looking largely at timber, we're looking largely at furs, and we can talk a little bit about furs later on. You're talking about grain, um, you're talking also about fish um, to sort of feed the population in the growing industrial cities of Europe. Um, they produce all of that and they sell that back to the sort of colonial nations. So in the early case of Canada, they're selling those resources back to France. And then France turns around and sells transformed goods. So instead of getting wheat, or getting wood, for example, timber from Canada, they send back things that have been transformed through, through their factories. So tables and ships and sort of paper and all of those sorts of sort of manufactured goods. And then the Canadians are expected to buy them back. Okay? This is a really lovely system for growing wealth in Europe um, because it means that you can buy your raw resources cheaper and you can sell your manufactured goods uh, sort of reliably because there's no one producing paper, there's no one producing ships, there's no one doing that sort of work in Canada. It's not such a great system for the colonies because what they're essentially doing is selling the cheap things, i.e. they're selling the raw resources, and buying the expensive ones, buying the ones that have been transformed through those industrial processes. So we don't necessarily have to get into that today, but understand that there's an argument that a colonial system a system where one party produces nothing but raw resources and is prevented, um, and we'll sort of talk about what, that, what those policies look like, from developing that kind of industrial economy is actually really bad for the colony because there's no way for them to manage to create that kind of space. They're not, they're not able to produce that same kind of wealth. Um, but it is really, really, really good. And we'll talk a little bit more about British trade policy later on, but it's really, really, really good for the colonial nation because they have these sort of access to those sorts of economic gains. Um, and those two ideas, those ideas about mercantilism, those idea, that idea about terra nullius, that idea about ethnocentrism, the idea that European powers were really looking for that sort of economic gain and prestige when they started colonies is really important to understand sort of as an idea foundation, not so much in terms of people always talked about it in those in those terms but because those ideas are really really important so that's our first video and i will get to our next one in a second